All right, everyone, in this video, I'm going to be breaking down Fables Volume 6. And this volume is a top tier volume. It is amazing. We're going to have a two parter Jack Horner storyline where Jack Horner has made off with billions of dollars from Fable Town, and he's going to Hollywood and is going to get a trilogy of movies based on his life made. How fun does that storyline sound? So good. Then we're going to have the Homeland story arc where Boy Blue is adventuring in the homelands, where the adversary will finally be revealed, and we will get to the adversary's origin. So that is some super exciting stuff. And in the final thoughts section of this video, I can finally tell you my thoughts on the adversary, so stay tuned for that. But for now, let's dive into it. Fables Volume 6, Homeland. Fables Volume 6 Homelands, written by Bill Willingham, art by Mark Buckingham and David Hahn. Fables Issue 34 Jack Be Nimble, Part 1 of 2. Shortly after Prince Charming took over as mayor, Jack Horner left Fable Town and made off with one of Bluebeard's treasure rooms and is driving all of that treasure in a truck across America. It was estimated last volume that Jack made off with in the neighborhood of 2.4 to 6 billion dollars. Beast suspected Jack might have been the one that took the treasure, but he had no proof on that. He only suspected Jack because Bigby always told him to always suspect Jack whenever anything happens. Although with no proof and with bigger matters to deal with, Jack basically made off scot-free with all of that treasure. So what is Jack planning on doing with these billions of dollars? There is a theory in Fable Town that the more popular a fable is, the more powerful that fable becomes. So Jack is planning on going to Hollywood and getting a trilogy of movies based on his life story so that he can become the most popular fable in existence. Jack is driving across America with Jill. Jill might be the Jill from Jack and Jill Go Up the Hill, except she is tiny. She is one of the Lilliputian tiny people that lives in small town up on the farm. Jill, due to her tiny size, was the one that stole the key to Bluebeard's treasure room for Jack. She gave it to Jack, which Jack used to steal some treasure. Jill initially is excited to be on this adventure with all this treasure with Jack, but Jack makes it clear to her, first of all, kiddo, it isn't our fortune, it's my fortune. All you get in return for helping me with my caper is this ride to parts unknown. You successfully escaped the farm in Fable Town, that's all you wanted. At least that's all you bargained for with me, so that's all you get. Jill says this isn't fair, and Jack tells her, and you've learned a valuable lesson, Jill. Next time, strike a better deal. When they arrive in Hollywood, Jack goes by a new name. He goes by the name John Trick. Jack, as John Trick, meets a small-time player in Hollywood named Bernard R. Stein. Jack tells him, How do you like to make some real money for once in your life, Bernie? Bernie, he's kind of interested. Jack tells him, I want to buy your exclusive services for one full month, premium pay. I'm new to Hollywood and the industry. I don't know nary a thing about it. The real inside shit, but you do. So you're going to teach me who the real players are and who's just blowing pretty smoke. Money's power here, and I know that much, and I have more money than God, so that means I have power, right? You're going to show me how to wield it, openly and bluntly like a hammer. Hell, like a big-ass atomic hammer. I don't have time to learn finesse. Bernard, he agrees to help Jack. The first move they do is Bernard helps Jack buy an old movie studio lot, which Jack renames Nimble Pictures. After a few more moves, Jack eventually has Bernard introduce him to a hot up-and-coming movie producer named Moss Waterhouse. Jack, he talks to Moss, they have a meeting. Jack wants to offer Moss the job as head of the studio, the public face of Nimble Pictures. Jack asks Moss to wow him in the interview. What did he bring to the table? Moss explained, Well, 
I'm a gay Jewish black liberal. I belong to all the right groups and support all the current trendy causes. From the highest studio taipans to the lowliest junior assistant agents. There's not a warm body in town that can risk not taking my call. Jack, impressed, hired him. And then in a very cold power move, pretty much just done to impress Moss, Jack turned to Bernie and fired him there on the spot. Jack told Bernie he outgrew him and we're playing above his league now. Later on in Jack's new Hollywood studio offices, he had a whole bunch of antique dollhouses brought in. Most people in Hollywood would just think that it was Jack being eccentric, but really it was so Jill would have a nice place to live in the studio. Jill, she kind of appreciated the dollhouses, but she tells Jack that she felt trapped there. She wanted to see the world, not be stuck in Jack's office all day. Jack tells her she's free to leave if she wants, but Jill says, how can I go anywhere on foot? I'd be some Monday rat's dinner before I got a block away. And I can't hitch a ride on a Monday bird, they don't talk. I miss the farm, Jack. I want to go home. And Jack replies, So what do I do about that? Just slip you in an envelope and mail you? Forget it. Jill, you're stuck with the bad decisions you made. Later on, Moss had pulled together a team of all Hollywood executives and players that Jack would need to get some movies made. Moss introduced Jack to them all. Of course, Jack was known as John Trick to the group. Jack told them all his plans for their first project, he says. Our first project is going to be a trilogy of blockbuster high fantasy films, like that furry little New Zealand guy did with the Lord of the Rings, only bigger and better, with more splash, more special effects, more spectacle, more everything. Our budget for the first three films, shot simultaneously, is a modest 600 million, or more if we need it. Now as to the subject we're going to do, we're going to do the life story of Jack. Jack of the Tales, the one who climbed the beanstalk when he was a kid, that's the first movie. And then slew giants when he got older, that's the second movie. And in the third movie, he comes to America, beats the devil in a poker game, seduces Snow White, Cinderella, Rapunzel, and Sleeping Beauty, and eventually kills the big bad wolf in single combat. One of the execs in the room says, you can't do that. Those are all characters from different stories. They aren't part of the same fictional universe. Jack replies, who cares? Moss turns to that exec and says, pack your bags, Rodriguez, you're fired. You're a can't-do guy and we're a can-do operation. There's no room for you here, buddy. Jack then tells the rest of them to get to work. He says, we're going to hire the hottest screenwriters in the business, and by close of play today, I want at least a dozen pitch meetings set up for the first thing next week. Jack, he also wanted the biggest Hollywood star to play Jack. So, they got themselves Brad Pitt. <laughs> well, over the next several months, the ball got rolling, scripts were written, sets were built, and then they were rebuilt because they weren't big enough. The writer of the first Jack movie in a testimonial set of Jack, whom he knew as John Trick. John Trick was the biggest asshole I ever met. I had to rewrite my screenplay seven times for him, and he's still pissed all over it until it smelled like him. He had to control every aspect of the story. No one else could contribute ideas. Even though his sense of story structure could best be described as amateurish and insepid, he would even messenger me pages of dialogue he wrote himself. Handwritten crap, misspelled completely, alien syntax, grammar, and absolutely bizarre punctuation. The first Jack movie was finally made. Jack and the Beanstalk. It was finally premiere night. Jack, or John Trick as he was publicly known in Hollywood, was nowhere to be seen. Jack, he was trying to be elusive, not in the public eye. He mostly did this because he did not want to get in trouble with Fabletown. The man he hired to be the studio head, Moss Waterhouse, he would be the face of the company. We see Moss doing an interview, facing questions from reporters. They ask him who John Trick is and if John would be here at the movie premiere tonight. Moss, he would try to dance around those questions. He would say, who knows, Gilda? Maybe he's already here, but the night isn't about him. It's about the first of the Jack films. 
back at the studio offices. Jack and Jill are talking about all of Jack's scheming in Hollywood. Jack, he's drinking champagne, and he says that this time this scheme's gonna work. He has no intention of ever getting caught. Fables, issue 35. Jack Be Nimble, part two of two. The first Jack movie was a huge hit. The second Jack movie was weeks away from opening, and it promised to be an even bigger hit. Jack, he was enjoying his new wealthy life, as well as the many women that he would bang. Jack had been in Hollywood for four years now at this point. Moss told Jack that he should do an interview, at least one. He said, this is Hollywood, Jack. We're eating your own young as a virtue. Fascination can all too quickly turn into resentment here. If their hunger isn't fed, love will inevitably turn to hate. I've seen it happen before, so you gotta let them get one good look at you, and then they'll dutifully respond by finding some other shiny bobble to fix their attention on. Jack, he refuses to do an interview, though. He does not want to be a public figure. He tells Moss that that's what he pays him for, and he pays him a king's ransom to do it, and he will replace him if needed. Moss says that won't be necessary. Jack notices that Moss looks a little glum. Jack asks him what does he want. Moss says, I want more real responsibility, not just pretend to run the show so you can stay in the background. Jack says, sure, what in particular does he want? Moss says he wants the authority to choose future movie projects. Now that the Jack films are almost done, Jack says, sure, done with the exception of anything in the fable, folklore, or fairy tale genres. I still need to be consulted on those. What else you want? Moss says he wants to expand, bring special effects labs in-house. Jack says do it. Moss says he also wants Jack to stop nailing the female staff. They can't face another wrongful termination suit. Jack laughs at this and calls Moss a tyrant, and he drives off in his sports car. Jill. She has become a little bit fed up being cooped up here for years and the way that Jack treats her. So she gets on the phone and she decides to rat Jack out to someone in Fabletown. The second Jack movie opens and it is even bigger than the first one. Massive hit, lots of money coming in. Moss gets a mysterious call from someone in Fabletown who claims to know who their boss, John Trick, actually is. Later on in his office, Jack is looking at his movie trilogy posters. He is so pleased. He comments, Jack of the Tales is on his way to becoming the most well-known fairy tale character in history. Not just the films, which will eventually show in every country in the world, but the merchandising too, the toys, the action figures, the official adaptations, novels, and comic books. The animated series too, let's not forget that. As Jack is thinking about all the future projects that will come about, he gets pulled into an emergency board meeting. Moss has apparently overtaken the company and Moss fires Jack with glee. Jack is confused. He encompasses most of the board seats. How is this possible? Moss tells Jack, maybe you better go see the man waiting in your office while we finish getting the paperwork ready. He'll explain everything to you. In Jack's office, Beast is there. Beast is the sheriff of Fabletown. Beast says that Jill phoned him and told him everything Jack has been up to. And he tells Jack it's all over. Jack angrily asks Jill, Jill, you ratted me out? Jill replies, you should have treated me better, Jack. Jack, he threatens to find a fly swatter or a bug spray and use it on Jill. Beast tells Jack to calm down. Jack asks Beast or what? Try to throw down with me and I'll mop the floor with you. Beast transforms into his beast form, which is not something Jack knew Beast knew how to do. So Jack, he sits down. Beast, he then transforms back into his human form. Beast informs Jack that he has to now legally sign over the company to Moss Waterhouse. Fabletown is going to be Moss's extremely silent partner. Jack asks, why would I ever do that? I didn't do anything wrong. Beast tells Jack, you stole lots of money from us. Jack replies, yeah, 
and I turned that fortune into a vastly bigger fortune. I can pay you back right now with interest and still have enough left over to... Beastie cuts in and says, And you also entered one of the forbidden professions. You risked drawing attention to our true nature. Beast tells Jack that the Fable Town Brass wants Jack's head on a platter. They want him dead for what he did. But Beast, he tells Jack, Look, I've managed to last nearly five years as sheriff without spilling any blood, and I'd like to keep that record going a little bit longer. So here's what we're going to do. I assume you have a safe somewhere in this room with a bundle of untraceable emergency cash in it? You can take as much of it as you can fit into this briefcase. Jack is annoyed, he says. That won't even amount to a fraction of what I'm currently worth. Beast tells him, too bad. The rest of the money belongs to Fable Town now. Now I'm going to go back and tell my superiors there that you gave me the slip. And then you are going to disappear forever. And if you ever stick your head up again, I'll arrest you or kill you. Whichever seems the more viable option at the time. Jack despite losing most of his fortune, takes solace in the fact that the movies are hugely popular and it will make him all the more powerful because of it. He tells Beast, fine, ruin my new life and steal my money, but I still win. I am the most popular fable in existence now. The Mondays absolutely adore me and that translates into raw power. I'll never die, never grow old, and I'll bet you'd have one hell of a time killing me now even if you tried. So I've accomplished everything I set out to do, and you can't take any of that back. I finally succeeded in a big way. You can't unmake the films. I doubt you could even stop the third one from coming out. Beast this says, Why would we want to? The lion's share of the money it makes will flow into our coffers now. Who cares if it also makes you the most popular girl in school? I don't even mind if it really does make you more magically powerful, as long as you stay hidden. From now on. Later on, back in Fable Town, Flycatcher is talking with Grimble. Flycatcher tells Grimble he's gonna go see the newest Jack movie. He says they're showing all three Jack movies back to back, nine hours total, dusk till dawn. Grimble asks, Haven't you seen them before? Flycatcher responds, At least a dozen times each, but I never get tired of them. Wanna come with me? Grimble replies, Nah. I never had much use for that boy. Flycatcher answers, I didn't like Jack before either, but now that he's so famous, you know, I wonder how he's doing. I wonder if we'll ever see him again. And we see Jack walking down the highway. He's hitchhiking. He's off to his next adventure. Now, we covered around five years of time following Jack. The next issue will turn the clock back and we will see what happened in Fable Town and the Homelands during this time. Fables, issue 36, Homelands, part 1, Death and Taxes. In an interesting change of perspective, we will now get to see what life is like in the Homelands now, under the adversary's rule. Two goblin soldiers, Throck and Ogryn, are collecting taxes for the Empire. As they walk their route collecting taxes, the two talk about their lives, as co-workers would. Ogryn has a human mistress. Throck comments, Ugh, how can you stand touching her? They're so pink and soft, hardly a distinguishing mole, canker, or blemish among them. Ogryn responds, Take my word for it, Throck. They'll get to look good to you once you've been away from your wife as long as I've been away from mine. They then go visit a poor woman, and they tell her she owes 63 pence. The woman complains it is too much money, winter was brutal, and she has mouths to feed, but they force her to pay what she owes. As they walk, Ogren comments that, My mistress's cooking is bad. Last night she cooked something called chicken for me. She told me, trust me, it tastes like snake. So I tried a bite, thought I was gonna die. Later that night, as Throck and Ogren set up camp for the night, they heard a horn blowing. Throck got a little scared. He tells a rumor of someone called the Black Knight. Ogren laughs it off, but Throck explains, Laugh if you want, but I heard it directly from Corporal Crump. 
The Black Knight hunts these woods, killing innocent tax collectors and stealing the money. And every time just before he appears, he sounds his hunting horn. It's always the last thing you hear before he cuts your throat. As the two goblins talk some more, this is when Boy Blue appears to them. Boy Blue is actually this mysterious Black Knight the goblins were gossiping about. Boy Blue has been missing from Fable Town for months. He is known to have stolen the Witching Cloak, the Vorpal Sword, as well as Pinocchio, and he teleported to the homelands. He is here to do some spying, find out who the adversary is, find him, maybe even kill him if he can. He is also here to find his love, Red Riding Hood, the real one, and bring her back to safety. Also, if he can find Geppetto, perhaps Geppetto can bring Pinocchio back to life. Now, Boy Blue is just one person, but with the magical witching cloak and the Vorpal sword, Boy Blue is a formidable foe as the witching cloak and the Vorpal sword are super OP, mega overpowered. Back in the Battle of the Last Castle, Boy Blue did not know the full limits of the witching cloak, but now he has been practicing with it in Fable Town for years, and he knows how to do all sorts of tricks with it. So let's talk about these two items he has in a little bit more in depth. The Witching Cloak allows teleportation as long as the user knows where they want to appear. It can also make the wearer invisible if they wish. They can also change their form to whatever they desire, looking like another person or an animal. The cape is nearly indestructible, and it thereby protects the wearer from harm. The interior of the cloak also contains effectively an unlimited storage capacity, so Boy Blue can keep all sorts of stuff in it, with its weight and dimensions of the objects inside having no effect on the wearer or the cloak itself. The storage space is unable to be accessed by those who do not know how. There can also be keywords used to activate certain abilities in the cloak. Super overpowered. There is also the Vorpal Sword. The Vorpal Sword is an enchanted weapon that kills anything with a single cut. It makes the distinct snicker-snack sound with each strike. With these two weapons, Boy Blue is a one-man army. So Boy Blue reveals himself to these two goblin tax collectors. They charge at him. The goblins swing their weapons right into Boy Blue, but the Witching Cloak absorbs it like it is nothing to Boy Blue. He is completely unharmed. Boy Blue then, with his Vorpal Sword, swings through the goblins' weapons, splitting them in half. Their weapons are useless now. Boy Blue wants to question them for information. The location of the gates to the next world, troop deployments, etc. The goblins refuse, though, and they just keep attacking. They bring out their backup weapons and start using those. Boy Blue is forced to kill them with one solid swing of the Vorpal Blade Snickersnack. He slices through them. Boy Blue, he later on explores more of this world he is in. He goes to the Governor General of the Empire in this land. Boy Blue kills him, and then using the cloak, he shapeshifts into a copy of that Governor General. Boy Blue, now impersonating the Governor General, traveled further. He journeyed for weeks and he finally arrived at a guarded gate to the next world. The next world is a secluded backdoor shortcut to where the adversary is. The goblins on guard here are hesitant to let Boy Blue through, but Boy Blue, looking like their governor general, orders them to let him pass, so they have no choice but to comply. Boy Blue, he enters the next world. It is dark and desolate. Boy Blue, using the witching cloak, transforms himself into a bird and flies covering great distances. He travels to the other side of this world. It takes weeks. At the end of this world, he comes across a dragon named Old Worm. Fables Issue 37, Homelands Part 2, The St. George Syndrome. Boy Blue is forced to fight the dragon. After some back and forth, Boy Blue manages to wrap his witching cloak around the dragon's mouth. Since the witching cloak won't tear or burn, the dragon won't be able to get it off, and the dragon won't be able to blow its fire out of its mouth. 
so the fire inside the dragon's belly keeps growing and growing, and the dragon can never blow it out, so eventually the dragon explodes because it can't hold its fire breath forever. It turns out that the doorway to the next world was actually hidden inside the dragon itself. So Boy Blue enters the doorway portal and travels to the next realm through the dead dragon. And in the next world, Boy Blue travels on. In that world, he comes across a white knight called the White Rider of Dawn. They battle. In the course of their battle, the White Rider of Dawn says, I'll chop your skull and serve you up to Baba Yaga's bottomless stew pot. You'll simmer for weeks and make a tasty treat for her upon her return to these lands. Boy Blue tells the White Knight that Baba Yaga is dead. And then Boy Blue slices the White Rider's head off. The White Rider being headless somehow is still alive and talks. He tells Boy Blue that Boy Blue is lying. Baba Yaga is still alive, he says. She still lives, or me and my brothers would have ceased to exist the moment she died. So the White Rider Knight and his brothers are tied to Baba Yaga, and if Baba Yaga was truly dead, then they would have disappeared, but since they are still here, Baba Yaga must still be alive. Boy Blue thinks on it. He thought that she was dead. He saw Bigby throw her down the witching well, but then Boy Blue figures out that Bigby was probably pulling a fast one and has secretly been keeping her alive. Boy Blue, he travels on, and eventually he kills the next knight. This next knight of Baba Yaga's is orange color, and he is known as the Radiant Sun, the Knight of Midday. Boy Blue kills him and travels on. The last knight is the Dark Knight, the Rider Under the Stars, and Boy Blue slays him as well. Elsewhere in the homelands, in Calabri Anagni, the capital city of the Empire, located in the Toscane world. This is a fable world which is Italian in nature. Two bureaucrats that work for the adversary, or the emperor as they refer to him as, have been getting reports of this black knight, who is actually Boy Blue, and his various exploits. The two bureaucrats are the scribe minister Muddlecock, as well as senior undersecretary Mudsnipe. Muddlecock and Mudsnipe go over the various reports that they have received. They learn of deaths in the world of Cardan. The governor general was killed there, and then in the neighboring world of the Wastes of Scold, a dragon was killed there as well. And then in the next neighboring world of Rus, the three knights were killed there. The two bureaucrats theorize that whoever is responsible for all of these deaths must be coming here to the capital. It will take them some many months to cross over to the next gate. Minister Muddlecock theorizes, Hmm, our killer wields devices of great power. Since all such imperial devices are cataloged and traceable, we can assume these items are from outside the Empire. Mudsnipe adds, This implies that our killer is also an invader from outside the Empire. It's hard to narrow down from where, though as there are so many worlds we have yet to conquer. The two bureaucrats theorize that their attacker seems to be making their way to them. Perhaps it is an assassin meaning to kill their emperor. While they debate what to do, Boy Blue continues his journey. He transforms into multiple animals and travels across the land. Meanwhile, the bureaucrat, Senior Undersecretary Mudsnipe, goes over to the powerful Snow Queen and warns her of the coming threat, for surely she can protect the Emperor. The Snow Queen tells Mudsnipe, Our visitor may have some impressive things in his bag of tricks, but none of his heroics and backwoods conjurations impress me. No matter his talents, he's hardly comparable to your beloved Snow Queen. Fables, Issue 38, Homelands, Part 3, Petition Day. Today in the homeland capital city of Calabri and Agni is an event called Petition Day, 
in which many citizens can visit the capital and petition the emperor in person for a favor or ruling of some sort. The Snow Queen has been trying to find this Black Knight for weeks and months, and she believes that this is the day the mysterious assassin may try and strike at the Emperor. She says, This is Petition Day, the one day of the month in which the entire populace knows precisely where the Emperor will be. Two guards in the capital city are discussing this Petition Day on their way to the Emperor to protect him. One of the guards explains to the other, This is Petition Day in which our beloved Emperor graciously hears the grievances from any of the vast unwashed who cares to show up. At least that's how it works in theory. In practice, it's a bit more complicated. In a single day, the Emperor can hardly see everyone with the grievance. So Imperial bureaucrats take measures to winnow the herd down to something more manageable. Generally, there is some bribery at work, too, to get a spot. We see a massive line of people waiting to see the Emperor and petition him. One nobleman is waiting his audience with the Emperor. He has explained the formalities by some guards. The man is told, Lay your troubles at the feet of our glorious Emperor and be judged by his perfect wisdom and understanding. Follow your guard escort into the hall. Stop when he stops and immediately hit your knees, and don't speak until spoken to, and make your answers short and to the point, and keep your head bowed, never look directly at him. This nobleman petitioner is then allowed into the royal chamber. There are guards and a crowd of people, and the Snow Queen is there too, trying to find this mysterious assassin they have dubbed the Black Knight, whom is actually Boy Blue. The Snow Queen theorizes that the Black Knight may be in this very room. And also in that room, sitting on a throne, is the Emperor himself, the adversary in the flesh. The adversary is massive, shroud in armor like a knight. He wields a giant sword. He looks super intimidating. He looks like a boss in Elden Ring or something. Boy Blue is in fact in this crown, but we don't know who he is. He is impersonating someone, but who? He might be one of the guards, the Snow Queen. She suspects something is off. The Emperor asks, And what's your problem? The petitioner then explains, It's my brother. He inherited our father's estates along with me, but he's a crook and an imbecile. He disagrees with me on every matter. When to bring the crops in, how to manage the apple and cherry orchards. If I decide to do things one way, he'll insist on another way, just to be contrary. The Emperor listens to the man's problems. The Emperor thinks this is a family matter and should not be brought before him. He asks the man, What would you have me do? The man asks the Emperor, You have the power to retroactively change my father's will, leaving it all to me. My brother is ruining everything, we'll be penniless soon. The Emperor, he thinks on it, and then he makes a ruling, he says. No, we won't come between two brothers. Strong families are the foundation on which our empire is built. Instead, we'll remove the material things that cause division between you. We order all your fields and orchards burned, your wealth confiscated, your homes razed to the ground, and your slaves and tenants workers put to the sword. Now your brother and you have nothing left to fight over. The petitioner is outraged and yells at the emperor. He paid thousands for this audience, and the emperor just royally screwed him. The man is then hauled away for speaking back to his emperor. The Snow Queen, sensing Boy Blue is among them in the crowd, tells the crowd, listen everyone, listen to me. There's an assassin here among us within this hall. He's cloaked in some way that makes it impossible to pinpoint his identity, but I can discern some things. He'll be a stranger to us. I know he only entered the city today. Everyone, look around you. Point out anyone you don't recognize. One of the guards is suspicious of the guard he rode in with. He accuses the guard publicly. You! You arrived only this morning! A transfer for which I received no advance notice. Highly irregular. And, as I recall, 
you expressed particular interest in getting close to the Emperor. The other guard, who may or may not potentially be Boy Blue in disguise, says, I, I merely expressed my awe at the prospect of meeting him as anyone would. I was amazed and honored that I was chosen to be numbered among his immediate protectors today. The accused guard is forced to fight in a sword battle to defend himself, and he is killed when a sword is poked through him. Well, Boy Blue was not that soldier. Boy Blue was instead hiding under cover as a hag slave woman with a broom. Boy Blue, he transforms with the cloak back into his normal appearance, and he announces to the crowd, Typical aristocrats, you never take notice of the peasant class. I'm your killer! The Snow Queen yells, seeing Boy Blue kill him! Protect the Emperor! Boy Blue yells, too late! He climbs the Emperor, and with his vorpal sword, he slices and decapitates the Emperor, snickersnack. The Emperor's head falls to the floor. The Snow Queen yells, dear gods above and below! He's killed the Emperor! He's killed the Emperor! No one slay the assassin, I want him alive! Boy Blue replies, don't worry lady, with the powers and weapons I have, no one here has a remote chance of harming me. Boy Blue, he fights off some guards. With his cloak and sword, he easily beats them, slicing through many of them. The Snow Queen orders one of her captains to clear the hall, but don't let anyone who witnessed this leave the grounds. All that is left now is the Snow Queen and Boy Blue. Boy Blue, he did what he came to do though. He slayed the Emperor. He has no more reason to stay. Boy Blue, he transforms into a bird and he attempts to fly away. But the Snow Queen, well, she can't seem to kill Boy Blue and get through his witching cloak. She can freeze him with her magic. She casts a spell, freezing Boy Blue completely while he is in his bird form. Boy Blue falls to the ground and finally he is captured. Fables issue 39. Meanwhile, we will return to the homelands and continue that story, but for now we were checking back in on Fable Town and seeing what has gone on there. Mowgli, the main protagonist from the Jungle Book, arrives in New York City. Mowgli, like Cinderella, works for the sheriff of Fable Town, who at this point would be Beast. Mowgli is something called a tourist. And not a typical tourist like you and I, maybe. He is meant to keep an eye on the Fables who choose to live outside of Fable Town or the farm, and make sure their secrets aren't exposed by the Mundies. Mowgli has been traveling for several years and been living outside of Fable Town, but he has been called back in for a meeting with Prince Charming. Trusty John picks Mowgli up at the airport and then drives him to Fable Town. Once Mowgli arrives in Fable Town, Beast, along with Kay, who is assisting Beast, greets Mowgli. Mowgli is here for a big meeting with Prince Charming, but he is a few days early for that meeting, so for now, Mowgli intends to take a small trip up to the farm to visit some old friends. Beast and Kay, they are walking around, and they walk by Trusty John, who is carrying some of Mowgli's luggage. Beast and K greet Trusty John as they walk by him. And as Trusty John is out of earshot, K tells Beast, he's the one. Now, I mentioned when we first met K a few volumes ago, K has the ability to see every evil deed someone has done in their lives. This ability is troublesome to K, though, so he would often gouge out his eyes and live as a blind man so he wouldn't have to keep seeing the evil deeds of people. However, on the request of Beast, Bro Totenkinder has regrown Kay's eyes, and Beast and Kay have been walking around having Kay look at people and try to find some spies. When Kay looked at Trusty John right now, he saw that Trusty John is actually a spy for the adversary. Beast can't believe it. Trusty John is always so trusty. Kay says, you can't fool these eyes. Up at the farm, Mowgli visits his friend, the panther Bagheera. Bagheera is like a brother to Mowgli. 
Bagheera has been imprisoned here ever since the revolution up on the farm in Volume 2, which took place a few years ago in the world of fables. Bagheera explains to Mowgli that he did deserve punishment. He admits what he did was wrong. He was given the choice of hard labor or jail time. He is the only one that chose jail time. He says to Mowgli, I'm no lowly plow horse. I refuse to labor in the fields like some common draft animal. So this is Bagheera's punishment. Mowgli tells Bagheera that he's going to free him. He owes him a blood debt after all. In his younger days, Bagheera killed a fat bull to bribe a wolf pack into accepting Mowgli. And he also stopped them from handing Mowgli over to Shere Khan. In Fable Town, Beast and Grimble summon and force Trusty John into the business office. There, they confront him along with Kay, Prince Charming, and Beauty about the allegations from Kay about Trusty John being a spy for the adversary. Kay filled an entire notebook on all the stuff that Trusty John did. Prince Charming says, For the last four years you've been spying for the adversary. We already know how many secrets you sold. Beauty, she asks Trusty John, You're supposed to be the most faithful fable in history. That was the whole point of your story, so how could you betray us? Trusty John explains he didn't want to betray Fable Town. After all, he swore an unbreakable oath to Fable Town, but prior to that in the homelands, he swore an unbreakable oath to his previous king. Up until recently, he thought the king was dead, but it turned out that that previous king was still alive in the homelands and was under the adversary's control. So when that king somehow got in touch with Trusty John and told him to secretly spy on everyone in Fable Town and report back to the adversary's people, Trusty John had no choice but to comply as his first oath trumped the second. Later on, when Beast is alone in his office, Frau Totenkinder visits him. She tells Beast that she has some information she wants him to pass to the mayor, but she doesn't want Beast to reveal that she was the source of this information. Totenkinder tells Beast she has some of her own spies in the homelands, and she learned that Boy Blue has been captured. Beast, he eventually tells Prince Charming this. Prince Charming, still talking to Trusty John, tells him his punishment for his betrayals. He says, I've decided it's best for the community if you simply disappear without a trace. So most fables can go on their lives never knowing how badly you sold them out. We'll let them keep their fond memories of you as a gesture of mercy you don't deserve. I'm willing to let you jump down the witching well alive and under your own power. The alternative is Grimble puts a bullet through your head right now and we dump your corpse down there. Trusty John, deeply sorry for what he has done, decides he will jump down the witching well willingly to his death. At the end of the day, Beast and Prince Charming discuss how hard it was to do what they had to do today to Trusty John. Beast explains ever since the initial meeting where they brought his king along to prove he was still alive, Trusty John delivered his material through a system of dead drops. Whoever picks up that information does so long after John has come and gone. They never see each other. Beast, he proposes then that they continue these dead drops, but feed the homeland's false information, maybe undo some of the damage that Trusty John did. Mowgli, now back from the farm, finally has his meeting with Prince Charming. Prince Charming tells Mowgli that he will free his brother Bagheera in exchange for Mowgli bringing Bigby back here as Prince Charming has a very important assignment for him. Mowgli, he willingly accepts this mission if it will help free his brother. Fables issue 40, Homelands part 4. He's only a bird in a gilded cage. Returning back to the Homeland storyline now, the true identity of the adversary will finally be revealed. 
When Boy Blue wakes up after being frozen two issues ago by the Snow Queen, he is in a birdcage. And it turns out the so-called Emperor slash adversary he killed was only a decoy, an imposing, powerful figurehead that most believe is the real Emperor, but is really just a more complex wooden soldier, just like the ones that invaded Fable Town. The actual adversary and man pulling the strings behind the scenes is... Have you guys guessed who it is by now? It is... Geppetto, Pinocchio's creator slash father. He was not the adversary's slave. He is the adversary himself. But how and why? That will be answered soon. Personally, I think Geppetto is a great choice for the adversary as we will see in the coming volumes, but I think it is interesting to know that famously, Bill Willingham originally intended Peter Pan to actually be the adversary. In a 2007 interview, Bill Willingham explained he wanted Peter Pan to be the adversary. His thought process was Peter Pan always seemed like a villain. He would come into our world and steal our kids. He was going to make the pirates like Captain Hook be the good guys, and they were just going to Neverland to rescue the kids from Peter Pan. But they were only painted as pirates because Peter Pan was doing the press releases. Anyway, that was his concept, but while the character was not under copyright in America, Peter Pan was under copyright in England, so he couldn't use him, so he ended up pivoting to Geppetto. And I honestly think we are all the better for it. Boy Blue, in the cage, is talking to Geppetto. Geppetto greets Boy Blue and says, It took my best sorcerers most of a week and a way to change you back from the bird form you adopted and get the witching cloak away from you. Then it was an iffy thing for several days to see if you'd live to wake up or continue slipping away from us. Geppetto, he gives Boy Blue some water. He introduces himself and says, And you're Boy Blue, right? You were a friend to my son in the Monday world, before he died in the Fable Town battle? Baba Yaga handled the business badly. You can be sure she'll be reprimanded when your people decide to return her and my soldiers to me. Boy Blue comments, So the Mighty Emperor was just another one of your puppets all along. That means you're him, right? You're not the adversary slave. You don't need rescuing, you're the adversary himself. Geppetto explains, I guess that depends on what you mean, young man. I don't hold any grand title or official position in the Empire, but I am the power behind the throne. Hundreds of thrones, in fact. We tend to let the local kings continue to rule, once we've conquered them, as long as they remain loyal and pay their taxes. It's generally better that way. The secret to managing a large empire is in letting the locals continue to see familiar faces and maintain the illusion of autonomy. Boy Blue asks about the fake emperor he saw. Geppetto says, Oh, I thought it important that the main figurehead be more impressive than any mere king. Larger, scarier, and essentially immortal, as long as repairs are kept up. It turns out, a lot of the rulers throughout the many kingdoms in the homelands now are actually born from the same magic grove that first gave Geppetto Pinocchio, and Geppetto controls them like his puppets. Boy Blue feels so stupid that he thought he killed the real emperor earlier. Geppetto tells Boy Blue, Don't berate yourself, boy. You did more damage than you can imagine. After all, we can't allow people to see their indestructible and immortal emperor beheaded in public and then discover that he's made of wood. With the exception of the Snow Queen who knows the truth, everyone that witnessed Boy Blue behead that fake emperor earlier had to be put to death. Then of course Geppetto had to rebuild the emperor. Not only that, they're going to have to put all sorts of protection spells back on the emperor. Geppetto says, Then there'll be more spell work, of course. It'll take hundreds of sorcerers months to replace every protective spell your sword shattered as if they weren't there. Boy Blue's magical Vorpal Sword 
managed to cut through the many magics on the fake wooden emperor. Geppetto is admiring Boy Blue's witching cloak and all the many magics on it. Boy Blue says, It can't be destroyed unless I allow it, and you better hope I don't. The Vorpal Blade isn't the only thing I've stored inside it. Your son Pinocchio's in there too. After some more talking and a meal for Boy Blue, Geppetto and Boy Blue start talking a deal. Geppetto wants his first son, Pinocchio, back. Boy Blue explains, You should know I set a number of magical preconditions on the cloak before I ever set out on my quest. There's a certain word, if I speak it, that will cause Pinocchio's body, both halves, to spill out of the cloak. But there's also a certain word, if I speak it, that will cause the cloak to destroy itself, along with everything in it, and most of the surrounding countryside. Boy Blue, he then says a trigger word. He says, Satchmo! Boy Blue then continues, There, I've just armed the witching cloak to destroy itself if I fail to say a certain word every day. Looks like you'll have to keep me alive and relatively happy, old man. Geppetto remarks that Boy Blue is smart, smarter than he thought. He asks Boy Blue what does he want in exchange for Pinocchio. Boy Blue says he wants two things. Boy Blue, he knows that Geppetto will never let him leave willingly. He says any bargain you made to set me free would be under duress and broken the first chance you get. Geppetto admits this is true enough. Boy Blue then says what he wants then. He says, First, you have Red Riding Hood brought here alive and unharmed and make damn sure she's the real one this time. Second, you tell me your story. I'm determined to know how my best friend's kindly old father became the evil master of an evil empire. Boy Blue, he also requests to be allowed to talk to Pinocchio once Geppetto brings him back to life. This is just a request though, not a demand. Boy Blue says that once Geppetto has fulfilled all of his asks, Boy Blue will say a magic word and destroy the witching cloak and Vorpal sword as they are too powerful in Geppetto's hands, so no one will get them. Geppetto, he accepts Boy Blue's bargain as he does not really have to give up that much. All he has to do is bring Red Riding Hood here and tell his story. Geppetto, he sends for some of his guards to go out into the world and collect Red Riding Hood and bring her back. And then Geppetto sits down to fulfill one of the other obligations per their deal. He begins to tell his story to Boy Blue. Geppetto made Pinocchio from the wood in the magic grove. And the Blue Fairy made Pinocchio a real boy. Pinocchio, ever the rebellious vagabond, went on various adventures and was often away from home, away from Geppetto. Geppetto got lonely with Pinocchio away so much, so he created more older wooden children for himself. And not just men, too, daughters as well. From time to time, the Blue Fairy would visit him, and if she took a liking to one of Geppetto's children, she would transform them into a real boy or girl. She also told Geppetto, don't worry, old father. Our little vagabond Pinocchio has also broken my heart too many times. My spells now include bonds of loyalty to you and fealty to hearth and home. So unlike Pinocchio, who has more free will, all the subsequent wooden sons and daughters have to be fully loyal to Geppetto. Life went on like that for a while for Geppetto. One day, though, some locals in town visited Geppetto. They were friends of his. They were talking about their local count. They were complaining how he has been corrupted and has been making one bizarre edict after another. They say, one day he commands all of us to pay taxes and golden statues of his likeness. And then on the next day, he commands us to pay instead with exotic beasts from far corners of the world. Geppetto, he admits, it is dire indeed. But he asks, what help can I be? The men then come to Geppetto with a scheme. They explain, well, we've decided for the good of all to replace the Count. We want you to carve his double, his fetch, to become our new feudal lord. We'll make the switch at some opportune moment, and a measure of sanity will be restored to the land. Geppetto, he thought on it, and he said, hmm, this is possible, but he'd have to be a real man, not a wooden puppet. 
That means enlisting the Blue Fairy's help. The men asked, Do you think she would go along with it? Geppetto replied, She might. She'd likely find it amusing. But this plan could only succeed if the real Count was dead. What we're contemplating, good sirs, is the cold-blooded murder of our deal feudal lord. Well, Geppetto and his conspirators, they were fine with that. And the Blue Fairy, she went along with it, too. And it all worked out wonderfully. They killed the old Count and replaced him with the fake one. And the new fake Count ruled with perfect justice and worked tirelessly for the good of his people. And they all loved him for it. Of course, as time went on, his eldest son was an intolerable ass. So when they thought it was time for their beloved old Count to pass away, they replaced the son, too. And then over time, it became a habitual practice. Soon enough, every major ruling official for hundreds of miles was one of Geppetto's replacements. And thanks to the Blue Fairy's adjusted enchantments, every one of them was loyal to Geppetto. Boy Blue asks, And the Blue Fairy went along with this? Geppetto says, Well, at first she did, but eventually she grew tired of the dangerous game we played. Geppetto's other conspirators were a little bit too drunk with power, and they kept wanting others replaced. Geppetto eventually thought that too many of his conspirators knew of their schemes. He needed to do something. He needed to replace them too, but the Blue Fairy would never go along with that. So Geppetto had all the various kings and noble lords that he controlled and were loyal to him. He had them send their mages, magicians, and warlocks to Geppetto to instruct Geppetto in their hidden ways. The mages taught Geppetto how the Blue Fairy did what she did, and Geppetto learned how to do it himself. There was a problem, though. It required a unique power source which was tied to the Blue Fairy's own magical nature. So one day, Geppetto knocked out the Blue Fairy, kidnapped and drugged her, kept her comatose, and then he manufactured magical elixirs from her. And now, he has a never-ending supply of blue magic. Geppetto can now turn any of his wooden children into real flesh on his schedule, not hers. Sometimes he even uses a diluted potion to make certain aspects of a still wooden child seem real, such as the heads and hands of various wooden soldiers. While Geppetto is telling this story, we see the real Red Riding Hood is collected from her home by a soldier. She is told that she is needed by decree of the Emperor. She comes willingly. The soldiers tell her they are to escort her to some decrepit old woodcarver's hut a few leagues outside of the Imperial City. The soldier says God alone knows why. So the soldier himself, he does not even know the importance of Geppetto and now Geppetto is actually the Emperor. Geppetto continues explaining his story to Boy Blue. Eventually, Geppetto had to eliminate his co-conspirators, as they may reveal their secret. One by one, he killed them and or killed and replaced them. Geppetto, he didn't realize it at the time, but his empire was underway. The whole time, Geppetto was telling his story to Boy Blue. He was working on fixing Pinocchio up. Geppetto, he reattaches Pinocchio's parts and head. And then he uses some of the Blue Fairy's magic on Pinocchio. And then, Pinocchio springs to life again. And when Pinocchio awakens, he is confused, wondering where he is, and why is he naked? Fables, Issue 41, Homelands Part 5, The Conclusion, Pax Imperium. Geppetto continues his story. He continued his expansion of his empire, replacing leaders with his wooden soldiers that he would turn into real people. But eventually, even Geppetto couldn't keep expanding this way because the leaders he would have to replace were strangers to him in faraway lands. So that is when he turned to armed conquest. Not him personally. He never ventured out to conquer anything. He is no military man, but 
He had a number of armies dancing on his strings, and their lords and commanders who served him faithfully. He then also created the Emperor character, an imposing figure that would inspire loyalty. Geppetto explains to Boy Blue and Pinocchio, As much as possible, I let others run things. My sons and daughters, mostly. I'm content to stay here in my cozy workshop, occasionally setting broad goals and policies, but even that, necessities become rare these days. Pinocchio asks, how many siblings does he have? Geppetto answers, let's see. An average of about 20 a year times a dozen centuries. Oh, maybe tens of thousands or so? Pinocchio wonders, how many worlds has Geppetto conquered so far? Geppetto answers, a few hundred, give or take. We go through about 50 year cycles of expansion and consolidation. We've just started another expansion push. These are exciting times for the Empire. Having finally absorbed the last of the European fable worlds, we've just started our conquest of the Arabian worlds. We should be ready for the Asian or African kingdoms in only another century or two. Later that afternoon, Geppetto is resting outside, lying in the sun on a lawn chair. Pinocchio and Boy Blue get to talk alone. Pinocchio tells Boy Blue that he is torn. His dad is cool and everything, and it's great to see him again, but he is their greatest enemy. Boy Blue understands, but he says that he has spent too many years fighting Geppetto's armies to feel any compassion for him. Boy Blue asks Pinocchio to hand him his cloak that is on the chair over there. When Pinocchio touches the witching cloak, it zaps him. Pinocchio annoyed asks, Yow! Did you know that would happen? Boy Blue responds, Let's just say I suspected it. Your daddy's sorcerers are thorough. Boy Blue asks Pinocchio, If he could get the two of them out of here, would Pinocchio want to come? Pinocchio thinks on it and says, He's not sure. The next day, Red Riding Hood is brought to Geppetto's cottage. The real Red Riding Hood. Geppetto allows Boy Blue to talk to her. Boy Blue says, Oh dear God, after all these years, it's me, Ride. I know you're surprised to see me alive again, but I can explain that. It's me. This Red Riding Hood appears to have no idea who Boy Blue is, she says. Um, pleasure to meet you. Who are you again? Boy Blue tells her, I know it's been a long time, but you can't have forgotten how we met at the Keep at the World's End. You had a place on the last boat out of the homelands, but you... Stayed because you thought I had to stay behind, too? We had a magical night together? Red Riding Hood apologizes, but she does not know him. Boy Blue yells at Geppetto. He says, You promised me to bring the real one here! Geppetto says, He did. You wanted to meet the real Red Riding Hood, and I delivered her to you as promised. Boy Blue asks, But the girl I met at the world's end? Geppetto explains, She was probably false. One of my spies, just like the one you met in Fable Town. Boy Blue says that the Red Riding he met in Fable Town was not the same one he met at the World's End. And she is not this woman either. Geppetto explains, as I told you, I seldom involve myself in the fine points of our military or espionage operations. My spy masters must have duplicated Red Riding Hood back then, and Baba Yaga did the same when she went to Fable Town recently. Blue asks, why do they keep copying Red Riding Hood then? Geppetto answers, I don't know. You'd have to ask my spy masters. Maybe Red Riding Hood's especially trusted by you rebels? Or maybe it's as simple as she's easy to duplicate. Not everyone can be copied exactly though, or more than once. Boy Blue asks if Red Riding Hood has a good life here. Geppetto responds, who knows? And why should you care? She's just another peasant girl. One of the millions of my subjects you've never met before today. They're scum, most of them. Boy Blue asks if he can have a moment alone. Geppetto says, sure. But he has fulfilled all of his obligations to Boy Blue. So his jailers will be taking Boy Blue away tonight. Geppetto says he hasn't decided what he's going to do with Boy Blue yet. Either imprison him or send him off to the headsman. One or the other. Geppetto, he leaves his cottage and shuts the door. Boy Blue, he then smirks and comments to himself, Well, 
I guess my work here is done as well, then. Boy Blue, he says a trigger phrase. Big Walter Horton in the Witching Cloak teleports into Boy Blue's cage. Boy Blue apparently could have retrieved this Witching Cloak at any time. Boy Blue removes the Vorpal Sword from the cloak. He cuts his way out of the cage. Boy Blue then runs over to Geppetto and says, I've enjoyed your hospitality, old man, but I really must be on my way. Boy Blue then turns to Pinocchio and says, I hope you'll forgive me for this, Pinocchio, but he's a monster that needs to die. Boy Blue swings the Vorpal Sword at Geppetto. However, it appears Geppetto has some sort of magical, invisible force field around him, protecting him, even from the powerful magics of the Vorpal Sword. The Vorpal Sword merely hits the magical invisible barrier and bonks off of it. Geppetto comments to Boy Blue, Did you imagine any weapon could harm me, boy? Every imaginable protective spell has been layered over me for thousands of years. I'm astonished that your blade survived, though. No other weapon ever has. Oh shit. Geppetto has his guards fight Boy Blue. Boy Blue, he kills them, though. Geppetto yells for more guards to come. Boy Blue asks Pinocchio. Okay, Pinocchio, it's time to decide. Are you coming along or are you staying here? Choose now. Pinocchio is conflicted. He answers, I don't, I... I can't, I... Boy Blue is going to let Pinocchio stay then. Boy Blue, he decides to grab the real Red Riding Hood and take her with him. He grabs her and teleports both of them away. Geppetto, now furious, yells for more guards and more warlocks to come. And when Pinocchio tries to calm his father's anger down, Geppetto states, Your foolhardy friends made a dire enemy of me today. I'll have the Snow Queen tend to him personally. Boy Blue and Red Riding Hood are now miles away. Red Riding Hood is confused. Boy Blue explains that he met one of her doppelgangers in the past. That is why he thought he met her before. Red Riding Hood, remembering an incident in her past, comments, That's what they were doing to me in the Warlock's Hall all those times? Making fetches of me? That's the foulest sort of magic. Boy Blue says he is sorry he dragged her into this, but if they catch her now, they will do evil things to her, so... For better or worse, she is stuck with him. He is going to bring her to Fable Town. Boy Blue teleports himself and Red Riding Hood to Fable Town, out of the homelands. Boy Blue has been away from Fable Town for years. Boy Blue walks with Red Riding Hood into the Woodland Luxury Apartments building. Grimble is on high alert when he sees Red Riding Hood because she looks identical to the woman they know as Baba Yaga as Baba Yaga took on Red Riding Hood's appearance when she arrived. Boy Blue explains the situation to Grimble and tells her that this is the real Red Riding Hood. He gives her to Grimble and then Boy Blue walks on. Later on, Boy Blue is down in the business office where Prince Charming and Beauty are talking with him. They are very furious with him. Boy Blue is in a lot of trouble. He stole vital weapons and he took off. So many crimes he committed. Prince Charming says that they will hold a hearing. He orders Beauty to go and find somebody to represent Boy Blue. When Prince Charming and Boy Blue are alone, though, it is revealed that Prince Charming and Boy Blue were working together on this scheme all along. Charming is the one that gave Boy Blue the permission to take the witching cloak and everything he did. Charming tells Blue, We really will have to hold the trial, you know, and I'll have to find you guilty. Even with leniency, you'll do at least a month in the detention cell or some hard labor up at the farm. Otherwise, no one will believe you were acting on your own. Charming asks how the cloak worked out for Blue, and Boy Blue answers, Perfectly. I only wish I'd known how to fully utilize its abilities back at the keep at the world's end. If I did, I believe I could have won that battle on my own. Prince Charming then asks, And the intelligence you gathered on the adversary? Boy Blue answers, I got the whole story, plus tons of info on the general state of the Empire. Charming tells Boy Blue, You did it well, son. Better than we dared hope. Take a few hours before I have to throw you in the slammer. You'll have time to write your full report in jail. In the meantime, 
Go clean up, see some friends, and visit that girl of yours. Boy Billy replies, She's not my girl, sir. Turns out she's a stranger to me. Always was, in fact. And with this, we end Volume 6 of Fables. All right, so that was the Homeland story arc. Let me go through my thoughts. I really liked the Jack Horner storyline. I think it is such a fun concept of Jack trying to get these movies of his story made so that he will become the most powerful fable in existence because he will be so popular with the Mondays. That is just really fun stuff. I love seeing Hollywood asshole Jack. That's great. And of course, it kind of blows up in his face in the end. And he walks away with very little money, but those movies are still made and he is still more powerful now. So uh, just a fantastic Jack Horner storyline. And then we have the Homeland story arc with Boy Blue being the hero. And I like that Boy Blue is kind of not the hero you would expect, but yet he is so badass with this witching cloak and vorpal sword. Yes, the witching cloak is hella overpowered, but that's okay. It's still really cool watching his journey through the, the homelands. I also liked little touches like the goblins being tax collectors and just watching them be co-workers and have these conversations about their life was really fun too. But yes, back to Boy Blue now. When he finally gets to the Imperial City and we see this fake adversary, this imposing figure, which is exactly what you would imagine a big powerful adversary figure would be, and I love the subversion of that, that that's not actually the real adversary. And Boy Blue kills that adversary, and then he gets captured. And then we have the reveal that Geppetto is actually the adversary. And I love that that is a subversion you would not expect, really, that Geppetto, uh, Pinocchio's father, is the adversary? You would expect that to be maybe lame, but it's actually uh, a really cool story behind it. The story behind Geppetto being the adversary having to do with him slowly getting into that role, snowballing over the years, you know? Oh, let's just replace this one politician. Oh, let's replace this other one now. And then it keeps expanding and expanding. And then eventually Geppetto captures the Blue Fairy. And then he eliminates his co-conspirators. And before you know it, he's the adversary and he is controlling all. I love it. I love that Boy Blue escaped and is still living, and I love that he also tried to kill Geppetto before he left, but of course, Geppetto has magical force fields all around him. That is so great and badass. Oh man, this volume is, is great stuff. Uh, I'm going to give this one another 10 out of 10. Amazing stuff. Really progresses the plot. Really gives so many cool moments. This one was amazing. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. And uh, thank you all for watching, and I'll be back next week with more Fables.